Hello everyone and welcome to the Book of Bones YouTube channel. I'm Lucy, I'm a second year medic at Cambridge and if you're not sure how to approach the UK cat, this is the video for you. This will be a comprehensive guide with all the information in one place. So on the screen now will be timestamps for each section of the video if you only want to look at a specific part. The University Clinical Aptitude Test was known as the UK CAT prior to 2019. Since the test is now used in more than just the UK for medical school admissions, the name was changed to reflect that, but the content of the questions remains the same. So on to the first section who, when and where. Who needs to take the UK CAT? You will need to take this test if you're looking to apply for medicine or dentistry or even graduate entry medicine at certain UK universities that do not require the BMAT. You also need to take the UK CAT if you're planning on applying to these four non-UK universities on the screen. Essentially, if you don't plan on applying for a BMAT university, you will need to take the UK CAT for medicine or dentistry. Universities in Australia and New Zealand have also started to use the UCAT as an admissions test but these are taken at a different time period during the year, so it would be best to check the UCAT website for the most up-to-date information. The next question is when do I need to take the test? You will need to take the test in the summer before the admissions cycle begins. This means that for sixth form students, you need to take the test in the summer between year 12 and 13 or at the start of year 13. Registration opens a month before the testing begins, then the test period runs for three months and all the results are given before the UCAS deadline to allow you to make an informed decision on your university choices. You may only take the UK CAT once in a test period and results only apply for that application cycle. So if you plan to reapply the next year, then you'll need to take the UK CAT again for that cycle. Make sure that you get to booking quickly so that you get a slot you are happy with, especially if you have commitments over the summer. The slots do tend to go quite quickly. So the final bit that you need to know before taking the test is the cost. In the 2020 testing cycle, taking a test in the EU and UK will cost £75, and outside the EU will cost £120. These figures may change in future test sessions, so as with dates for registration, please check the UCAT website for the most up-to-date information. The UCAT offers a bursary scheme, and will also allow certain access requirements if you ask for them to ensure that as many people have an opportunity to take the test as possible. Please check the website for all the details if you think you may be eligible for these. The next section is about how to prepare for the UCAT. Firstly, you need to know what the structure of the test is. The test is a two hour long computerised multiple choice test. There are five sections, verbal reasoning, decision making, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning and situational judgment. Each of the first four sections are scaled to a score between 300 and 900 and situational judgment is scored with four bands. Band one being the best and band four being the worst. I'm going to give ways uh, for you guys to revise that do not require you to spend extra money as I believe you should not have to pay to study for these admissions tests as you're already paying quite a large sum to take the tests in the first place. So what knowledge do you need for the UCAT? For the UCAT, unlike the BMAT, you will need no prior knowledge other than GCSE maths. And as such, there's no list of information that you need to revise, but rather you need to familiarise yourself with the style of questions as they're very specific. The UCAT will test your logic, reasoning, reading and ability to identify patterns and therefore almost always the information you need will be in the question, aside from perhaps a few formulas you need to know from GCSE maths. You have to remember that this is an aptitude test. It's not designed to be particularly challenging, but rather it's to measure certain parts of your thinking process so that the universities have a baseline. To be successful in the UCAT, you need to understand what the question is asking you and what they are trying to test. If you know what the question is trying to test in you, then you can approach the question from a much better angle. So the next question is, how long should you spend revising for it? This will vary from person to person, and will also revolve around other commitments that you have during the summer. As a good guide, I would say that you need two to three weeks of doing a bit of work each day to ensure that you peak at the day of your exam. There is no point starting revision more than a month ahead of time, as you'll burn through all the available questions far ahead of time and when it comes close to the exam, you won't have any materials left to revise with. But uh, some advice, some personal advice from me is that before you even start answering any of the questions, you need to understand the types of questions that you can be asked in each section. If you don't spend this initial time to understand each of the questions, 
then answering practice questions, especially in the decision making and abstract reasoning sections, will be counterproductive. If you want to start building up your skills without using any of the practice questions available, I would advise looking back at GCSE maths and reading non-fiction texts to increase both your mental arithmetic and reading speed. These are skills that can be trained without using up any of the UCAT practice questions, as they are quite few in number. When you do start to look at practice questions, use the official UCAT questions. They will be linked in the description for you. Try to set aside roughly an hour each day to look at either one specific section or a few questions from each section. I recommend using the official UCAT questions, as they are in the style of the real exam. They allow you to practice with keyboard shortcuts, and the on-screen calculator. This helps you familiarise yourself with the format and ensures that you won't have any surprises when exam day comes. In the run-up to the exam, get into a good rhythm of looking at a few questions each day, reading up on model answers, and trying to understand the reason behind the answer. When you get to at least a week before the exam, or when you are comfortable with answering the questions, you need to start doing timed questions to make sure that you can answer them in the right time frame. Save the mock tests for three days before and the day before. One at three days to check your progress and to make last minute adjustments for any of the sections that you have trouble with still. And one on the last day to get you in the mindset for the test. Another question that people may have is, what if I'm going away in the summer? What do I do? I would say that there are two solutions to this. Either you bring the revision materials with you or you book the test so that you have two to three weeks leeway from the commitment. There isn't specifically any knowledge to learn, but you could always find a second-hand UCAT question book to bring on holiday if there isn't going to be good internet, or bring your laptop with you to try online practice questions. If you're going to be away for the whole summer, there is always the possibility that you can do the exam once school has started. If you do the revision right, you should only need to set aside a good two weeks of solid work to be completely ready for the exam. I'm now going to go over the specifics of each section in the test how best to revise for them, and the timings and number of questions for each section. The first section is verbal reasoning. You will be given 11 texts associated with four questions each. This means you'll have 44 questions to answer in the given 21 minutes. That's 28.6 seconds per question. You get one point for each question answered right. You will not need any prior knowledge to answer these questions, as this section is about your ability to read and process information presented to you in text. You may have to use critical reasoning and make inferences from the information. These questions are all single best answer. There are two types of questions in this section. They can either be true, false, can't tell questions or complete the question or statement. The first type of question are true, false, can't tell. True means that based on the text, the statement in the question is true. False is the opposite and can't tell is for when you don't know whether the statement is true or not, based on the text. There may not be enough information or the information in the text may not be as specific as the information given to you in the question. You may also sometimes have to use logic to get to the correct answer as what's written in the question may not be explicit in the text. And the second type of question is the complete the question or statement. Here you'll be given four options and you need to select the most appropriate answer based on the text. These are single best answer and as such only one should be the right answer. To practice for these types of questions, outside of doing examples, I would try reading through passages in textbooks and news articles. Being able to skim read is a massive advantage in this section. A tactic you may want to use is to read all the questions for a passage before reading the passage itself so you know what to look for, because you know there will always be four for each section of text. You can go backwards and forwards in the questions quite easily, especially if you use keyboard shortcuts. So as long as you don't forget to go back and answer all the questions, this might be a tactic that you want to use. The biggest downfall in this section will be a slow reading speed or skipping around through the passage of text so that some important information is not read. If the passage is particularly long, you won't have time to read all of it. So in those cases, you definitely need to look at the questions that you're trying to answer first. Find the references in the text and then read that entire paragraph around that bit. And remember, these questions are testing your comprehension and reading skills. So you'll have to come to decisions based on the text you've read. The next section is decision making. This section is heavily based on logic. There will be 29 questions with 31 minutes to answer them in, which means you'll have a lengthy 
64.1 seconds per question. Each question is a singular entity. None of the information carries over into the next question. In this section, questions with a single answer are worth one mark, but questions with multiple statements are worth two marks, with one mark being awarded for partially correct responses. You may have to look at charts, tables, graphs or other diagrams, and perhaps even short texts. Then you have to use the information that you've gleaned from the diagram to come to a logical answer. The questions in this section are perhaps the most varied, and there are a wide variety of diagrams. Remember that you can use the on-screen calculator in this section. There are two types of question format. Either you'll have one question with four options and a single correct answer, or you'll have to respond to five statements with a yes or no, and you'll have to drag the correct answer to each box. The topic of each question may be anything, including algebra with the shapes, Venn diagrams, syllogisms, probability, logic, and even questions that make assumptions. To do well in this section, you need to learn how Venn diagrams work. They come up quite frequently, even if they aren't drawn out. Syllogisms are also worth understanding and very frequently come up. These are logical conclusions drawn based on two statements given, such as the well-known all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. There are also some questions that require conditional logic, and that is certain events only happen after other certain events have occurred. When given a small block of text and a question making an assumption in this section, make sure that you address the concerns in the questions with your answer. It has to logically make sense, even if it's not your personal belief, and it has to address all parts of the issue. Another set of questions are where you're given a series of statements, and you have to figure out either the order of a list or match up objects with specific people. These are all logic puzzles that you can improve on with practice, and there are lots of free mobile games out there that you can try to help improve you in this area. Practicing with logic puzzles can help immensely with this section. Using a service such as Brilliant, even just using the free version, will help train your logic skills. Or if you're looking for completely free content, the YouTube channel TED-Ed has a great series of videos that explore lots of different logic puzzles and give you a chance to figure them out for yourselves before explaining the answers in detail. If you're finding it hard to picture or hold information in your head as you're doing these questions, make use of the note boards given to you. Make notes on what you're thinking. Turn the statements into a Venn diagram. These will help massively to bring some sort of order in the chaos and will help you collect your thinking so that you can answer the questions. Finally, there are pure probability questions in this section. These should be fairly simple but can take some time to figure out if the question is quite convoluted. Definitely use the noteboard or calculator to your advantage and make sure you draw out all your working if you can't figure it out directly in your head. So in conclusion, there are a very wide variety of questions in this section and the best way to improve this is to practice your logical thinking. The quantitative reasoning section tests your numerical skills. There will be an on-screen calculator and a noteboard that you can use in the exam to work things out. You'll have to answer 36 questions in 24 minutes, which means you'll have 40 seconds per question. Questions in this section are worth one mark per correct answer. This is a section where you can easily revise outside of the official questions. When you do the official practice questions and come across a formula that you do not know or a conversion that you aren't sure of, note it down and learn it. They are especially fond of using acres, so make sure you're comfortable using those. The goal of this section is not to test your maths abilities, it's to test your numerical reasoning. And therefore, it's more about problem solving and taking relevant information from a set of numerical data. To speed up your working in this section, learn how to use the on-screen calculator while doing practice tests. The calculator is cleared with the on slash C button and can be operated with the mouse or you can use number lock on the keyboard and use the number keys to speed up your working, which I highly recommend doing. In the real exam, the calculator will close when you click away from it, so do bear that in mind. These questions will contain tables, charts, or graphs. Some questions in this section are standalone, whereas others will have four questions relating to the same data. Each question will have five answer options. There are a wide variety of questions that could come up here, and the answers are usually self-explanatory, so I'll let you try out some questions for yourself. On to everyone's favourite section, abstract reasoning. <laughs> there will be 55 questions with only 13 minutes to answer them. That makes this the most time-constrained section, with only 14.1 seconds per question. As the name of this section states, 
you'll need to be able to find patterns from a given set of abstract shapes. This section is trying to show your ability to generate hypotheses, evaluate and change your thinking. Essentially, that means to do well in this section, you need to always be ready to change your hypothesis. Don't get stuck on the first idea that comes into your mind. Mental flexibility is very important here. There are four types of question, but there are a whole host of changes that they can make. Lots of factors come into play and you should bear these all in mind when you're looking at any question from this section. That includes the size, shape, position, orientation, number, colour, number of sides, intersections or areas. There will be distractions, red herrings and shapes that don't matter at all to throw you off. This is the section where it's often better to guess, flag and move on than it is to dwell on the answer, especially if you haven't got it after 15 seconds. You can always come back to flagged answers and change them at the end of each section if you have time. The four types of questions are as follows. Does the shape belong to set A, B or neither? Which shape belongs to set A or B, given four options? The next shape in series? Which shape completes the statement? For tackling the first two types of questions, where you're given two sets of six panels, it's really easy to get bogged down and feel overwhelmed by these questions, or perhaps start to overcomplicate them. Here's how to break it down and go from simple to complex in your thinking. First, look at the overall number of shapes in each box for set A and B. Are they all an even or odd number of shapes in each set? Look at the total number of sides next. This simple line of questioning is one that people tend to overlook, instead starting out with complex theories. The big picture is often very important as well. If there isn't a pattern there, then move on to the colour specific shapes. Look at the number of those, the number of sides, their direction, arrangement or size. Consider if there's anything odd or even that's the same. See if there's a pattern there. If there isn't a pattern in either the number or the colour, then look at the type of shape. See if there's a pattern specific to the triangles or circles or squares. Look to find shapes that are in common in all the panels. They could all contain triangles or all contain squares, and that's what the pattern will probably be related to. Look at the size of shapes, look at the arrangements, their directions, especially with arrows. And finally, after looking at all of those, if there isn't a simple theme, consider that it might be conditional. This could be the presence of a specific shape or direction of a shape that then changes other shapes in the panel. But this is the last thing that you consider. The biggest danger of this section is overcomplicating things. There is a lot of interference that is trying to make you think it's more complicated than it actually is. There is generally a very simple explanation, but in some cases there isn't, and this is what you consider as a last resort if you can't find a simple explanation. I will now go through one of each type of question so that you understand the logic behind how to approach these. I have come up with all these questions myself, and if you found these questions helpful, then please let me know in the comments and I might make a set of questions specifically for abstract reasoning that you'll be able to download as a PDF. It's quite hard to find free resources other than the official UCAT questions and I didn't want to use those up, so you could try those for yourself when you're doing your revision. If you want to try any of these questions for yourself, pause the video and try it out. The first question is uh, which of these shapes belong in the set question? and you're given four options. Let's go through this logically. Firstly, looking through at the number, all the panels in set A and B have a different number of shapes in them, so it's not the overall number. There's also no pattern in even or odd. So next we look at the colour. In set A, there are some grey shapes and there are some black circles. And in set B, there's a grey shape in one of the panels. This tells me that the grey shapes don't really have a bearing on what's happening. Okay, so then what about the black shapes? Well, it seems like there's not much of a pattern there either, except if we look at set B, we can see that when there's a black square, there's also a black circle. And then that leads us to look at set A and see that there's only black circles in some of the squares in set A. Okay, so that's where we stop for now with the colour. So then we look at the specific shapes. We look in set A and we see that there are triangles in every square. And then we look at set B and we see that there are squares in every square. That means that the pattern probably has something to do with those shapes. So putting it all together, if we look at the black circles, we can see that when there's black circles in set A, the triangle is no longer an equilateral triangle. 
and it becomes a right angled triangle. And then if we look at set B, the <coughs> what we come up, what we came up with earlier is true. When there's a black circle, there's a black square. And without a black circle, there's a white square. But there's always a square in the set. So as such, the answer is D. That was quite a tough question. So massive congrats if you managed to get the answer for that one. So the second question is one where they give you four different shapes and you have to say whether they fit in set A, set B or neither. If we look at the number of shapes, it's again different in every panel, so we can't use that as a metric. But then we can look at the number of sides, because they're all the same colour, so that isn't something we need to consider. It's most likely something to do with the number of sides, because all the shapes are also different, apart from the one arrow in every single panel. That signals to us that it should be something about the arrow. If we look at the arrow in set A, it points to the left when there are an even number of sides on the other shapes and it points upwards when there are an odd number of sides on the other shapes. And the opposite is true in set B, which means of the test shapes, the first two should be in set B and the last two should be in set A. The next type of question is the complete the statement question. You'll be given two panels that logically follow one another and then one panel that needs to be completed. You need to use the same logic from the first two panels and apply that to the answer. Things to look out for include colour changes, reflections, rotations, adding or taking away sides and increasing or decreasing in number. I'll go through an example to show you how to approach this. In the top two panels you can see that the shapes all become stacked and then change colour. So this is what we have to apply to the bottom panel and that means that B is the correct answer. Be wary of questions that are partly correct because if you glance through them quickly you might pick the wrong answer even if it seems quite obvious after you look at it. The final type of question will be the next in series. You'll be given four panels and have to give the fifth panel in the sequence. You have to look for the same things as you would in the complete the statement questions. The pattern's usually fairly obvious, at least compared to the set A, B type questions. Look at these panels as a whole, try to see the progression, and then look at the individual panels and the difference between one and the next. Here's an example. So looking at this final example, we can see that all the shapes change places. The general picture is that all the shapes move around one space clockwise. The arrow is also turning clockwise. You can see that there's a change in colour and this seems to be based not on the position of the shape but rather which shape it is. You can see that the shape that's not a circle gains a side each time and that means C is the correct answer. The only way to get better at these questions is just to do them. I've linked a few free sources that I have found in the description and if you guys want me to I might put together a few more questions in this style and make it available as a PDF. Please let me know in the comments if that would be helpful. Finally, situational judgement. This is a section that tests your ability to understand scenarios in the real world. This is scored separately from the four previous cognitive tests. For each question in this section, full marks are awarded if you select the correct answer, whereas partial marks are awarded if you select a response close to the correct answer. You'll get 22 scenarios with 69 questions that you need to answer in 26 minutes, making that 22.6 seconds per question. You'll be given a set of scenarios that you may be asked up to five questions about. You need to think about the appropriate course of action and possible implications of those actions. What you are being tested on here is your ability to focus on the critical factors and use appropriate actions in dealing with them. No prior knowledge of medicine is required in this section. You should absolutely read the GMC guide on what a modern doctor should be. There are two styles of question in this section. Either rate the response from the four options or choose the most and least appropriate from three options. The best way to prepare for this section is to look at a lot of model answers and explanations. Eventually you'll be able to see patterns of what's acceptable or appropriate or what isn't. You should try to find a direct solution to the problem that puts the patient first, that doesn't disadvantage or harm anyone. These will generally just come with practice or reading the GMC guidelines and understanding what a doctor should be doing and what they should be putting in their mind first when dealing with patients. So this is a short section on test techniques. 
This is what you should do while actually taking the test and should hope to implement while doing practice tests. In order to actually perform well under time pressure, you need to adopt the guest flag and skip method. You are not negatively marked, so any question that you do not answer disadvantages you. This means that if you find yourself unable to answer a question, pick a random answer, flag the question and come back to it at the end. In terms of time management, this is something you'll need to work on during your practice sessions. If you find that you're slow at a specific question type, it may be that you have to flag it immediately, get the fast questions done first, and then come back to those slow ones at the end. Some sections, you'll have more time than you think you do, and what's important is to go with your gut instinct. If you change around your answers too much while checking, you could be losing your self-marks. Know that you have a noteboard at your disposal, and don't try to do all the working in your head. To speed up the experience, use keyboard shortcuts. These are explained in the instructions, Practice using these during your sessions, along with the on-screen calculator. So, moving on to the day of the test. You've prepared hard, you've done your revision, now it's test day. What can you expect to happen? As of the 1st of June, UCAT have confirmed that the 2020 testing cycle will continue as planned with minor changes, that being the introduction of the online proctoring system. You'll still have the opportunity to choose whether you go in person to a test centre or book an online test. This is of course dependent on which test centres are open. It's worth getting familiar with the official UCAT rules and regulations before taking the exam. On test day you will need to sign a copy of these rules to state that you agree. So what do you bring to test day? You need to bring some form of photocard ID and yourself and that's pretty much all you need. What happens when you arrive at the test centre? You need to arrive at least a good 15 minutes before your exam so that you can complete the registration process in good time. If you arrive late, you may not be allowed to take the test. You will have your photo taken and your ID checked, and then you'll be asked to read and sign a copy of the rules to show that you understand them and will abide by them. You can then put your personal belongings into lockers. You are not allowed to bring anything into the exam room apart from yourself and the clothes that you are wearing. The invigilators will perform a routine check on you by asking you to roll up your sleeves and turn out your pockets. They will also check glasses for cameras before you enter the examination room. Throughout the exam you will be monitored on CCTV by the invigilator, meaning that if you have an issue all you need to do is raise your hand. Once you begin the test cannot be paused. If you need to leave the room for any reason when you come back, you'll be asked to go through the security check once again. Once you have completed the test, you'll get your results on a printout. The results will be sent to your institutions that you've applied to on UCAS at a specific date. And that's it for the test centre exam. Now what about the online exam? The Person VUE online proctoring system allows you to take the UCAT whilst still socially distancing from lockdown. It will be essentially virtually proctored during the exam. You need a functioning webcam and microphone to do this test. You will still have your ID checked and your photo taken, and then you have to take photos of your surroundings. You need to remove all notes from around your desk and anything that could be seen as an aid during the exam. Your invigilator will monitor you throughout the two hour test as normal. Pearson have put out an informational video about this service and it will be linked to in the description. Learn how to use the on-screen noteboard. UCAT will shortly be adding this feature to the online mock exams to allow you to prepare. And that's what to expect when you come to doing the actual exams. Now on to the next section, which is what to do after you get your score. We'll put the average scores for each section and the deciles up on screen for the 2019 test cycle. Generally, getting a score of around the 70th to 80th decile will guarantee you an interview at most institutions. This means you have to get a total of around 2,600 to 2,700 in the cognitive tests. Every institution will use it differently. Some use a sum of the scores, some use an average, and some use a score from a specific section. After universities look at the score, it can be used as a rank metric or as a hard cutoff for interviewees or it can be used as part of a whole application where they take into account everything else as well. The sheer volume of medical applicants means that these aptitude tests are used as an easy way to discriminate between candidates. It isn't perfect, but when everyone has very similar grades, doing well on the UCAT can make you stand out. So what if I get a low score? It's not the end of the world. Some universities may set a much lower boundary and invite more people to interview where you can impress them. Some put less weighting on the UCAT in general. If your score is around the 50th to 60th decile, there are definitely institutions that will give you an interview. With a lower UCAT score, it's about gaming the system. 
such that you apply to places more likely to give interviews to more candidates. If you think that you won't be happy in those places, consider perhaps applying for biomed at a university that you really like, or taking a year out and trying again in the next application cycle. So what if I get a particularly high score? Pick a university and a city that you like. After all, medical schools will teach you the information that you need to become a doctor. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter at all which medical school you went to when you become a foundation year doctor. So you really want to find a university that you'll have fun at, that you'll want to spend the next five plus years at. And that is in conjunction with if you're taking the BMAT, make sure you have a good balance of institutions. So what if my situational judgment is low? So what if I get a low situational judgment band? Not all hope is lost. Some universities don't consider it at all, but some do eliminate band four candidates. Some give points on the band as part of the whole application, and if your cognitive scores are good enough, these might be the institutions you should go for. Having a low situational judgement band is not the end of the world, and in fact only 17% of candidates get a band one. The majority will get a band two or three. This generally has very little bearing on your application, if your other four sections are good and you apply to universities that don't take it into account as much. Overall, you should look through the list of UCAT universities and look at how they use the UCAT to determine where to apply to. At the end of the day, it's up to you which universities you apply to. I personally think you should prioritise somewhere that you'll like studying at because you'll be there for the next big chapter of your life. So don't focus too hard and trying to get into a specific uni based on their UCAT application process. If you do well enough, then you should be applying for universities that you really want to be at. I hope this video was helpful. I've spent a long time making it and put a lot of effort into it. And I hope it helps someone out there with their application for medicine. Let me know in the comments if this type of content was useful. Leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. Share this video with friends and family, it might help. That's all for now and I will see you next week. Bye!